Well, thank you. Thank you for the, the introduction and thank you for the uh, organizers of the workshop. So based on the last talk, I'm kind of wondering if I should have talked about the, the quantum computing work that we've been uh, doing, but instead I'm gonna be discussing some of the, um, the tensor product state work um, for, for simulating chemical systems. Let me see, okay, there we go. So um, let's see, so I'm gonna run out of time. I'll tell you that uh, right up front. But and just because of that, I wanna make sure I have time to give some uh, acknowledgements. So this is a nice group photo we took. We're not, we're not irresponsible. We took this photo before COVID. Um, so it's kind of out of date. We've had some people leave and, and some people join, but, uh, um, but the work I'm gonna be talking about today is, is uh, the project from uh, Vibin Abraham's project. He's a really talented graduate student in his fifth year. So he's gonna be graduating and within the year. So, you know, if you're looking for postdocs, uh, you know, to hire postdocs, keep him in mind, he's, he's quite good. Um, this work is funded by the NSF. And um, we also wanna mention that we, we use the, we've been using the software tools developed um, uh, by, this originally came out of Garnet Chan's group. So it's this PySCF software. It's really nice, um, especially if you're, if you're doing development in um, and really focusing on strong correlation, it, it gives you a really nice interface. We started off, uh, so most of the work I'm gonna talk about is, is developed inside of Python on top of this. It, over the past, it, you know, maybe handful of months, um, I actually basically, I started learning Julia to distract myself from, from the very contentious election that uh, the US had in, in, in November. So I started learning Julia language um, and it's been really fun to, and, and I really like doing it. So we've been starting to move our code over from Python to Julia, but it, it works really well and plays nicely with PySCF. So um, just kind of give a few acknowledgements of the people who have developed these fantastic tools that we're using. Okay, so um, I yeah there has there's there's maybe um, uh, it's worthwhile to explain a little bit about what computational chemistry is. Um, so we are in a chemistry department, and so that that means that we kind of naturally care about problems related to chemistry, be that chemical synthesis, catalysis, properties like photovolt, you know, systems. In, involved in photovoltaics and whatever the, the type of, of issue may be. So, you know, how does, how does computational chemistry function and how do, how, do, how do computations interact with lab and, and, and experiment design? And so, you know, if you, if you kind of wanted to know why does this matter, why is this important, you could imagine just some kind of catalytic process. Um, and I think this is, this is generally the way people, um, the, kind of the default approach that people have in terms of understanding the way computation interacts with experiment. So let's say you had some kind of ch chemical transformation that uh, you'd like to study. So maybe two chemical species, X and Y, and they're gonna to go to Z. So if you just look at this, it has to go through some high energy barrier. And, and depending on how, how high in energy this is, this reaction could occur at room temperature. Or if it's, if it's a very high barrier, you'd need to increase the, uh, the temperature of your, of your reaction conditions or your pressure, whatever, whatever uh, depending on the system the, and the experiment that you're studying. But if you have, if you have this reaction carry, being carried out in the presence of a catalyst, then, then what you might imagine is that you'd have some kind of lower energy path Perhaps it's a more complicated path, but the but the overall barrier is now has been suppressed so that the reaction can occur at a lower temperature. So then the way a computational chemist might you know offer value in a, in a chemistry type problem or a chemistry setting is that one could come in and like maybe look at these different stationary points on this curve, and then carry out a calculation to compute what the energy of that system would be. That way you wouldn't have to do the experiment, and then make a prediction about what the energy is at each one of these points. And if the, the if the overall barrier is then if you can prove it with a simulation that that you never need more than than you know a certain amount of energy, then you can make a prediction that this reaction should occur at some lower temperature, um, uh, you know, than than you would need without the catalyst. So that, you know it's just like a simple example of of you know how you might use computational chemistry to improve the you know design of new molecules, the conversion of of complicated molecules that you know like CO two and and things like this into, into um, uh, more useful and valuable 
materials. So, you, you know, you could also apply the same strategy if you were interested in trying to develop materials or molecular materials that had certain kind of optical properties for whatever kind of technology you're interested in. But all, all you know, there's a whole family of these different types of, of possible applications that you can apply, apply computational chemistry in, where the, the main kind of description of this is that you're running some simulation to predict the outcome of an experiment that has yet to be done. And so this kind of predictive component is really um, uh, really kind of at the core of what, what you know, brings value and makes computational chemistry interesting. But you know, I also feel like this, this, there's another aspect to this that is, is at least as important, perhaps more important or at least more interesting, I, I feel, is that, is that you know, whenever you carry out a simulation, you set up that, that, that simulation. You know, it's, it's on your computer, you've set it up, you know where every single atom is, you have this, you know, incredible high resolution microscopic detailed picture of whatever process or transformation taking place on your computer. And this is a, this is a, a resolution, a microscopic view that you don't have in an experiment. So what you can do is you can go in and, and look at the details of your simulation and extract a much deeper understanding about the actual physical processes at play, develop a much better qualitative understanding of what actually, you know, why does this, why does this um, uh, cat catalyzed reaction coordinate, why is it lowered in energy? And then once you, once you understand those at a qualitative level, then you can start rationally discussing and, 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 and thinking about how to, how to, you know, move in new directions. So, so that, that's kind of a very, very brief bird's eye view of what, you know, what computational chemistry is, how one might use it and why it, why it's, um, uh, important and, and valuable to, to, to chemists beyond just, uh, beyond just theoretical chemists. So, you know, all of these, these different types of projects, um, or, or, um, uh, ways of, of, of contributing to, to chemistry research, not all of them, but but a large amount of them really kind of reduce to this problem of finding low energy states, um, low energy eigenstates of an operator. So so the, the operator at play here is the is the molecular Hamiltonian. And so if you haven't seen this before, um, you know th that's fine. You know I, th I think the the key ideas throughout this talk um, should still be intact. That this uh, looks pretty um, uh, foreign, but. You know, these, if you, if you have seen these or if you've maybe worked with condensed matter Hamiltonians, model Hamiltonians or whatever, you can imagine these as these are just um, creation and annihilation operators. So this P dagger is just a, a conventional fermionic creation operator that acts on site P. So this this could be like a, if you imagine like a, a Hubbard model, this would be like a, a, a fermionic Hubbard site. In our context, that relates to a, a molecular orbital, if, if you've been familiar with those. Um, and so, but the, the, the key characteristic, this Hamiltonian, and the one that we'll, you know, um, kind of relate back to later on, is that this Hamiltonian operator has only one particle and two particle components. And so, you know, in, in the space of all possible operators, you may imagine concerning yourselves with, this is actually quite simple. Now, it's, it's funny to refer to the, the, the uh, ab initio electronic structure Hamiltonian as simple, especially if you're kind of more familiar with a condensed matter Hamiltonian, which is, which is a greatly simplified version of this. But, but you, know, you, you can imagine much more complicated Hamiltonians, and you really do run into those situations if you start trying to do more uh, kind of fancier things of like downfolding spaces and, and stuff. But this is, this is really kind of like the, the, the physical ab initio Hamiltonian that we concern ourselves with. And so then at the of the day we have this this eigenvalue problem and so you know this this gives us access to all kind of like stationary properties of molecular systems which allows us to answer lots of important questions okay so it's simple enough we've got this relatively simple hamiltonian um, we we just want to know what eigen what the eigenstates are um, but but this is a very complicated task and and the complications arise because of the the, the size the dimension of the space on which this operator acts so you know what we're looking for is a solution to you know an eigenvector that and this, so this is our, our our target solution and so we're looking for a vector in this space um, a linear combination of these these so-called occupation number vectors. So, you know, what we have is depending on the number of, you could, if, if you're more familiar with Hubbard, so this would be the number of lattice sites, or in our case, the number of molecular orbitals, you have a vector of that length, 
And each one of these occupation numbers is either going to be a zero or a one. And, and if you look over here, what that means is that that's going to tell you whether or not that fermionic orbital is occupied or unoccupied. And that is the, the total possible allowed values for each one of those different um, occupation numbers. And so, you know, here you would have one, 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 zero, 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 and then, and then so forth. So, so really what we're doing is, is expressing the, the basis in terms of bit strings of occupations. And so that we have a coefficient in front of each one of them. And so if you just look at this, you know, the dimension of each index is two. So the dimension of the space starts out as two to the K where K is the number of, of orbitals. Now the, the Hamiltonian itself has some symmetries that we can exploit um, right off the bat. You know, it's particle number conserving that, um, and then it's also, um, uh, oops, I... Yeah, since we're paused, could you um, say just in mathematical language what the symmetries are that you have? Yeah, so these would be um, uh, part. Uh, so the first one would be a particle number conserving operator, and that means that. So let's see if we wanted to talk about it in math. So I'm I'm very much a, a very poor mathematician, but uh, maybe you would refer to these as as these all have the same Hamming weight in the bit strings. Um, and then we also, so that would be kind of like the first symmetry that we would we would have because the, the operator itself never changes anytime it, it annihilates an, uh, an electron, it creates one. So, but we also have this other symmetry in this in the second set that is uh, a spin symmetry. And so the fermions themselves being fermions, they're split up into two flavors, right? One up and one down. And the Hamiltonian itself never changes that. So if we started adding magnetic fields and things like this, that would change. but the, 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 the Hamiltonian itself has this time reversal symmetry that allows us to um, uh, uh, work in a basis, a truncated basis that um, preserves the number of spin, both spin up and spin down electrons. Does, did that answer your question or did I successfully? Yeah, perfect. It? I, I got it. Okay. So All right. two times. One is the skew symmetry, the second, second one, and the first one is this Hamming weight thing. Both of those make perfect sense. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so, so we have this, um, this, the, these symmetries that we can reduce the problem down, and um, but again, it's it's still combinatorial. So it's it, you know th these are pretty modest um, uh, reductions if we're close to half filling, you know, where the, the number of electrons is getting close to the number of orbitals, um, and so so we have this problem where the dimension of the space is is very large, and so you know if you wanted to simulate this exactly. And you just create a bit a vector of bit strings, and then you optimize this. You'd be limited to about uh, eighteen if you were really, you know, um, trying to do things um, in a kind of a conventional sense. I think the the total bottleneck is about twenty. So, you know, going beyond twenty is um, is a problem, and that's really where you have to start making approximations. Okay. Hold on. Are you trying to advance the slides? Yeah, I was trying to, and I'm, my thing got frozen here. The If you click inside the slide area, maybe it'll advance. There you go. Okay, so so if, if we want to go beyond the the 20 orbital case, what must we do, right? So, so we've got to start making approximations. And so one of the, the, the best ways to do this is to start with a mean field approximation. So what we can do if you've used mean field approximations is we're going to take our two particle operator and we're going to approximate it. We're going to you know, say that two of these indices, we, we're just going to take an expectation value of, and now we're left with an effective one particle operator. And we know how to solve a one particle operator exactly. Problem is, we don't know what this density matrix, th this density operator is. So this kind of puts you in this situ situation where you need to kind of make a guess and then you, then you update your Hamiltonian and then you solve this self consistently. And so that's kind of like the general way we go about doing a mean field approximation in a many body type setting. Um, and the, the nice thing about this is what it, it does is it gives you this, this effective one particle operator See, so this is the, the one particle part and it's quadratic. So we know how to um, solve that exactly. And so, you know, at self-consistency, this is, this is equivalent to then saying, I'm just going to represent my state as a single electronic configuration with proper spin symmetry and then use the variational principle 
to then change the orbitals themselves the, or the, you know, mix the lattice sites of a, of a fermionic system and change those orbitals such that the energy of this electronic configuration is minimized variationally. And so we just, we use a variational principle on one of the basis vectors, one of the bit strings. And the nice thing about this is that what this is going to do is it's going to, you know, in, in using only that, that simple, you know, uh, easy, um, readily accessible information, maximize the, the overlap of one of the bit strings on the, the final exact wave function. So it's gonna create a gap here. And so what that means is that as it, it, we're gonna change the shape of these orbitals such that this one electronic configuration is lowest in energy, as low in energy as possible. And that's going to create a gap between these other electronic configurations. And now in the, in the, in the case where the mean field approximation works well, and, and another way of maybe articulating that is that when you make this approximation, you're, you're really saying that the, the average value is described by the mean, you know, or the, 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 the Hamiltonian is well described by this mean value. But if, and so if the fluctuations about this mean are very minimal, then it means that this, this effective uh, mean field operator is very descriptive. And so that the energies of these individual electronic configurations are gonna be well described uh, by, the res, uh, by, by the resulting Hamiltonian. So when, when you do this, then, then the number of, of excitations you are away from this mean field reference, in, you know, the, the more excitations away you are, the higher in energy those electronic configurations are gonna be. And so what that means is that the further away you get from this reference state, the less and less important they are and the smaller of a coefficient each one of those bit strings or each one of the electronic configurations are going to have on the final wave function. So, you know, in that, in that picture, this is, this is kind of really what's, what sets the stage for almost every um, uh, approximation that, that we use in, in computational chemistry or, or electronic structure theory. So starting with this mean field solution, we can then now start to um, go beyond this Hartree-Fock picture and then start trying to describe those, those higher energy electronic configurations that we initially kind of discarded. And, and we can do that in, in a number of different ways. So we, we could start with like, you know, stochastic type approaches, uh, uh, FCI, QMC, and, and other types of, 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 of methods. By far the most widely used approach would simply be to um, uh, truncate that space based on excitation rank. So, so you know, if, if the if the Hartree-Fock solution is is accurate, it means that these that the further away from from the the reference state you get in terms of you know occupation swaps, each one is going to increase the the, the energy. And so, what we can do is say, let's truncate the space down to the number of bit strings that differ from this reference state by my, maybe like two excitations. So that's kind of the most common approach. And inside of that type of, of family of approximations, you have you can do it variationally through configuration interaction or CI, uh, but then also you know perturbative approaches, kind of infinite order digrammatic techniques inside of that, that excitation rank truncated approach. Okay, so that's really where almost all of quantum chemistry lives. Um, at when, and when I, uh, at least wave function based, I mean, I'm not even touched on DFT um, and I, I always avoid it by saying that wave functions are, are better, but really it's just because I don't understand DFT and that's why I avoid it. But the issue here is that what we're going to do is now move to this, this kind of third item. And this is, this is uh, the, 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 well, it's going to be the focus of, of the rest of what I talk about, but it, it's, it's quite distinct from the, the standard approach of this kind of excitation rank truncation in that it doesn't make any a priori assumptions about the nature of the state that you're trying to describe. It, it, it leaves all of the possible bit strings available, and, but it's going, to do, it's going to seek them out adaptively. And so, it, and this is something that we that um, the field calls selected CI, selected configuration interaction, and and it's it's very simple. Um, the, the 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 general algorithm of this. So, what what you do is you would start with some some initial reference state, and this could be the mean field solution. It could be a handful of configurations that you just kind of from physical and in, in, in intuition, you know, are going to be important, but you start from some, some initial reference space, and then you, you, you solve the problem variationally in that space. And then you apply the Hamiltonian operator to this, and it's going to now connect to, to many more electronic configurations. 
But the, the, because this operator is only, has only one and two particle operators inside of it, the number of new configurations that it touches is always polynomial. It's going to be a quartic number of new electronic configurations. So then you can, you can walk through this polynomial set of bit strings and then make a decision based on, on whether or not you think it's going to be important or not. And so the, the way it's generally done, there are, there are other approaches, but the way it's generally done is you would, you would look at each one of these electronic configurations and compute the perturbation, use, use perturbation theory to compute the first order coefficient to determine whether or not it's going to be important or not. And if it's larger than some value, then you say, okay, it's, it's important, I'm gonna add it to my reference space. And so then you come back into here and you've got an, an enlarged uh, uh, variational space. You solve the Hamiltonian variationally in this space. You get an improved uh, reference space that then you apply the Hamiltonian to it again. And then you just keep iterating this until the, the, the variational subspace that is determined from this algorithm based on one th um, accuracy knob is, is uh, so, so that it stops changing. And so what that means is that once you've re reached this, this um, convergence, it means that everything within some, some threshold that you've determined, whether it's usually based on some, some first order estimate of the, uh, of the coefficient, then you've included all of that in this variational space. And then at the end of the day, you can also then come back and then compute an, a, a perturbative correction um, to, to partially account for the, the degrees of freedom that you discarded. But what this allows you to do is, is slowly increase the accuracy by decreasing this threshold. And then you can converge to, to um, the, the exact solution to within uh, you know, whatever kind of accuracy threshold you, you would like. So you know, th this works really well when the, the reference state has a large weight on the, on, the, um, on, on the target state, or at least when the number of, of bit strings or the number of electronic configurations that have non-negligible weight um, is, is relatively small. And, and so you know, this, this means that the performance of this selected CI, it really depends on the sparsity of the, the exact wave function, right? You can't, you can't use this to discover some sparsity that doesn't exist. If you have a strongly correlated system, and one, one that means that the, the mean field pictured isn't very good, then you're going to have a large number of, of configurations that are important, and then you won't be able to, you know, the selected CI procedure will tell you that. <clears throat> and Nick, just to let you know, you have about five minutes left. Oh. Um, <laughs> you can go into the question period if you prefer. Oh, wow. Okay. So um, I'm going to... I'm going a lot slower. Okay, so um, so what we want to do is we want to um, improve the performance of the selected CI to work when there's strong correlation. Okay, so the the strategy we're going to take, I'm going to skip over some stuff, but so the strategy we're going to take is to find a basis which increases the sparsity. And so we know that, you know, like we've already seen this before, right? When we do the mean field transformation, it, it increases the sparsity of the, of the wave function a bit. But what we want to do is go beyond this. So we're going to move from a bit string representation to a, a basis of tensor product states. And, and, one, and, and doing so in such a way that it, it increases the, the, um, the compactness of the final wave function such that the selected CI procedure can discover that sparsity. So, you know, th this then now gets into what is the most compact representation that we could use, right? So this is, this is clearly a system dependent property, right? If you've got a one dimensional system, then a, then a matrix product state is, is the ideal. If you've, got, if you've got a 2D system or a tree, you know, like a dendromer type, type topology, then you, all of these kind of have their own kind of optimal type representations. Um, and so what we're going to look at is kind of move away from this type lattice picture to these types of systems that have a, a clusterable type character to them. So these would be systems where you've got a lot of strong interactions amongst you know, subsets of orbitals and then weak interactions between them. And so these would be just kind of like a handful of different chemical systems that we could have in mind whenever we develop, we develop this formalism. So we're going to identify, the, the, the basic strategy we're gonna follow is that we're gonna identify clusters of strongly interacting orbitals, solve a local problem, and then, and then use those local uh, um, correlated or entangled local states 
as a basis such that then we can now represent you know, the full Hilbert space in terms of these global vectors of tensor products of these locally entangled states. Okay, so that's the, the, the I've got to figure in just a second to kind of clarify that. And then in, that, in, this, in this tensor product states, uh, state basis, we're now going to use this selected CI algorithm to discover the sparsity and try to leverage that for uh, an efficient simulation. There's a lot of existing work in, in, in these kind of local tensor product uh, type representations, um, but uh, I, I won't go through what, what each of those approaches are. So this is the general algorithm. We've got um, uh, uh, three different clusters, and this cartoon here indicates that we've we've um, we have the ground state of each one active, and so then the tensor product state is then just the, the product of the ground states. But this really kind of gives us access to the full Hilbert space, um, and so what we'll do is then start with no longer bit strings, but just tensor product states, and and solve the Hamiltonian exactly in the basis of these tensor product states apply the Hamiltonian, make the same selection like, like we talked about before with the bit strings. And then we're going to then increase the size of our variational space, resolve it, apply the Hamiltonian, and we're just going to iterate this until the size of our variational space decreases. And so, you know, this, this, you know, the hope for this is that, that in this tensor product state basis, the, 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 the form of the wave function is going to have much fewer significant components such that the selected CI procedure can discover those. Um, the, the downside of this is that it, it, greatly increases the complexity of actually forming the computations. So whereas bit strings, you can, you can directly read off matrix elements. Um, here, whenever we want to compute a matrix elements, we have to start doing tensor contractions. So we end up breaking up the, the, the Hamiltonian operator into one, two, three, and four body operators, depending on how many clusters they act upon. We, we kind of reorganize this, sorting the operators, keeping track of the fermionic signs. And, and now whenever we go to compute a matrix element, so this would be an example of a tensor product state where the Greek letters are the cluster state, you know, the local eigenstate index. So we're gonna take this two body, op so this would be an example, like a two body component from that operator. You can see that what we're going to do is come in and form the matrix representation of the second quantized operators in the local basis. So each of these are local quantities. So if the size of the system increases, it doesn't increase the size of this quantity. And so then we, we have these representations stored in a dictionary. And so whenever it's time to compute this, we, we pull them out of a dictionary. And then we do this tensor contraction, which is a four index, a five index, and a three index tensor. And so because we only have one, two, three, and four body operators, we can you know, hand code all of these things and it doesn't require some kind of dynamical tensor network um, approach. And this would be an example of what's often the rate limiting step, which is the four body term. You can see that you've got five different tensors here, four, three body, and then a four body term. So, and you know, I, we can talk more about how this is actually done and, and there's some screening techniques that we have, but um, uh, we can talk about that offline. So I'm gonna skip over the uh, kind of the diagrammatic interpretation and I just wanna show you that it works. So, yeah. Just to let you know that that's the end of the scheduled talk period, but please feel free to continue into the question period. Okay, I'll just uh, give a, another slide and then um, just show this data that it, that it works, and then we can we can start moving on to some questions. Thanks. So, um, and thank you for the heads up. Um, so, so in order to test this, what we could do is 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 take this system and and apply it to to non non bonded systems. Um, some of the some of which I had shown before, but but those are somewhat not interesting because we know it's going to work, right? It's it's once you have the infrastructure set up, it will work. We wanted to test how how reliant on this clusterable condition is our algorithm, such that we kind of know how far we can push it. So we we selected these these kind of what we call pi delocalized systems. So if you're familiar with graphene, this would be like a a small section of graphene, a little like nano flake of graphene. So the key characteristic of these physical systems is that the electrons are completely smeared out, delocalized across the, the top and bottom of these, of these flat molecules. So, so in, in one sense, it sounds like that would be a very challenging example, test case for our approach. 
But coming at this as a chemist, you know, I don't look at it as, as just a sea of electrons. We have these, you know, um, notions of Clara's rule, and, and there's a lot of structure that lives inside of that, you know, sequence of hexagons that we can start to exploit. And so it really does behave, at least in my view, as a, as a set of connected hexagons, as opposed to just a delocalized C. So what we can do is then start with small systems, increase the system size, and see how it behaves. So, you, you know, I've got two systems which are um, small. They've got um, 24 orbitals. And see, this is already four beyond what you could do in a, in a tr straightforward sense. So, the, the, so this approach that we've developed is called Tensor Product State Selected CI or TIPSI. And so that's what these red numbers are. And we're going to com compare them to the bit string based or the, the electron configuration based selected CI, which is uh, one flavor is heat bath CI. So that's what these blue dots are. And so what we can see is that as we increase this accuracy threshold, the variational number of the class of the traditional approach, it increases as it should. And then this is the perturbative correction on top of it. And these things are nice because they follow a very linear path. So you can extrapolate to kind of gauge how far you are away from convergence. But if you, if you carry out this in a tensor product basis, you can see that we're, we're clustered right down here near the extrapolated limit. And so in fact, if you look here, the, the um, variational energy is within the um, uh, chemical accuracy, which is our, our notion of, of meaningfully accurate of the extrapolated limit. And so we have a variational bound on how this, uh, what the energy of the system is. We, you know, looking at this system, it's not as clusterable, but we still have reasonable performance here. The, the, the difference isn't as night and day, but if we increase the system size now to 36 and 42, remember this is a combinatorial scaling. So it's, it's, it's a huge increase. We, we, this, this behaves very, um, uh, very well as we increase the system size. Um, these, these tensor product based re results are much lower in energy than the, 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 the bit string representations that we were able to obtain. Um, even here, when we get to something that's 42 electrons and 42 orbitals, the, the extrapolated results are now differing by a, a much larger um, uh, uh, gap than what we even consider as chemical accurate. So, so this is really a qualitative change in, in how we were able to, to carry out this calculation. Um, you know, I have, I've, we have some, some extended algorithms that kind of modify this instead of using a, a low, like a sparsity condition. Um, we've, we've used a, a low rank condition. I'm not going to go through that algorithm, but it, it works uh, pretty well. It's, it's unpublished. We're still kind of tweaking the code there, but it, 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 uh, it works really well. And I'll just leave the conclusions up here. And uh, maybe if we have any questions, I'd be happy to discuss.